Good morning and welcome back, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Andre Platzer, I should say our first speaker for the day. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Andre uh, during a visit in 2010 to CMU, and uh, then I started learning about all the great work that he's been doing on hybrid systems, and uh, in particular, uh, differential dynamic logic. And since then, I've also enjoyed very much following uh, all kinds of really exciting things coming out of his group, which is now working on a whole bunch of different uh, aspects of uh, hybrid systems and uh, applying it to cyber physical systems. So in the spirit of uh, short introductions and without further ado, uh, welcome, Andre. Thank you. And thanks really for introducing me and inviting me in the first place. Um, so this is a very high flying place, which means we'll start the day with a lot of high expectations. Um, slight bumper on that. Um, even though um, I uh, have a whole book with me, I will not be able to uh, go through the whole book today. But um, there is a new book on logical foundations for cyber physical systems that's going to appear uh, a little later this year, which covers everything I say in a lot more detail in, in a rather readable way. So I inv invite you to check that out. The logical foundations of cyber physical systems, what does that mean to me? Well, to me it means basically the the question which control decisions are safe, uh, for example, for aircraft collision avoidance. If you are this pilot, uh, or if you build the computer for this uh, uh, plane that the pilot is flying, and the pilot got into a bit of a tight spot with other aircraft, it would be brilliant if we had a way of saying um, that the red trajectories are probably not a good idea because they get too close to where the other aircraft will be heading, but the right, a sharp right turn in blue is a great idea. Of course, if the pilot got into this situation right here, then the pilot didn't notice that this was happen. The ground control didn't notice that this was going to happen. So chances are you need great advice real fast. And the things that are really fast are computers, obviously. But they had better also be right, because there certainly isn't any time to sit down and carefully plan out each of those trajectories and sit down with a piece of paper and try to figure out, okay, that one is a bad idea, that will crash, that one is a bad idea, it will be too close, that one is a bad idea, it will crash. That one, yeah, looks good. And in fact, even if that looks good, you also need to pay attention to make sure that later on, whatever is happening, should the pilot be stressed out and get, it, get into yet another encounter with yet another aircraft, that you will be allowing enough maneuvering room and so on. So computers are brilliant fast, but of course the decisions have to be right that they give the pilot. And they have to take into account that when pilots are under a lot of stress, they might you know, exercise trajectories a little bit differently than they would do in calm, fair weather conditions. So cyber physical <coughs> systems exercise exactly that. Mixes of cyber capabilities such as communica communication, computation, and control with physical capabilities such as the very motion of this aircraft through the air in ways that solve problems that each of the individual ones couldn't solve. For example, you know, the computer alone is wonderful, but it can't make you move here out of the way from the other two aircraft, so you need the physics. The physics alone is also beautiful, but it won't give you good advice on what you need to be doing at, at that moment. That's where the computer comes in. But of course, this is only ex exemplary. Uh, and their CPS is promise an equally transformative impact in uh, driver assistance technology or pilot decision support systems, uh, UAVs, uh, train protection systems, or uh, ground robots and many other scenarios. This is a very personally biased list of CPSs that I've been personally involved in, but there's lots more that, um, you know, where CPS uh, effects are relevant. And of course, all of them promise a better safety <coughs> and efficiency. Uh, improvements, but the prereq is that the CPSs need to be safe. So how do we make sure that CPSs actually make the world a better place as opposed to, you know, having this transformative impact be the impact and transformation of a collision of two cars or something like that. So the real question is, can you trust a computer to control physics? And I do not mean that in the sense of the computer changing the laws of physics, because that's really hard to do. I just mean that in the sense of the computer pro providing the right input into physics. So the right you know, uh, steering of the aileron and rudder and thrust and all kinds of things for aircraft, for example, or left and right steering and acceleration and braking for cars, 
or robots for that matter, if they happen to be on the ground. So the answer for me, well, depends on how it's been programmed and it depends on what will happen if it malfunctions. For example, if you talk about a Bluetooth connected GPS controlled electric toothbrush, damage that they can do is rather limited. So it's not that important, except maybe to your teeth. But that's certainly not the case for the aircraft or the trains or robots or cars I've been talking about. So the rationale behind my research is that, well, computers would gain such a trust if only they came with guarantees. And in order for those guarantees to work out, you do need uh, analytic foundations and preferably foundations that are common to all of the cyber-physical systems. You don't want a special kind of mathematics that only and exclusively works for trains but doesn't operate well for cars and aircraft. Of course, granted, what you have to do in a car is fundamentally different than what you have to do in an aircraft. They, they, they fly and drive quite differently. But that, that shouldn't damage our mathematics to think about it. It should be the same kind of reasoning principles, the same kind of mathematics that makes us steer toward coming up with, okay, different answers, <coughs> but answers about, you know, in this coming that we come up in the same way. Um, and of course it is the case that foundations have revolutionized the digital part of computer science and indirectly our whole society, but maybe we need much stronger foundations when that software is reaching out into the physical world because a lot more is at stake when we talk about aircraft flying or trains driving, like the train that got me here earlier uh, or last night. So uh, my conclusion from this list, and I hope you see why it's there, is that CPSs are so important that they do deserve proof as safety evidence and nothing less than that. The clue to make everything happen, and the most important insight in my research probably, is that CPSs are actually multi-dynamical systems, by which I mean that they're characterized by multiple facets of dynamical systems. There's a discrete dynamical systems aspect coming very naturally from the discrete computation, the one step at a time computation that computers are very good at, or digital controllers are very good at. The physical, oops, sorry, wrong button. The continuous dynamics coming from the physical motion. Uh, but there's more to that. Multi-dynamical systems may also have adversarial dynamical aspects whenever multiple systems are in you know, potential competition for one another or or maybe you know, they just have imperfect information and because you don't know what the others are doing, maybe there's an adversarial way how the situation will be resolving. Because if a bunch of uh, self-driving cars meet, there's no, you know, no reason to expect that they would all harmoniously always reach the best decision that is happening for everybody uh, under all circumstances. But you two, for example, sensor noise and all kinds of things. And oh, like, let's go back to the aircraft example. If you have two pilots, None of them are gonna try to die, right? But they might still mis misestimate the situation. If you have a very simple protocol saying, okay, how about we always fly such that the, the aircraft that's already f higher up will keep on climbing while the other one keeps descending. That sounds like a brilliant plan, but it won't work because if both of them say, yeah, I think I'm higher up, right? Then they'll both climb and, and, and then you're still in a disastrous situation. Understanding when that happens and what you can do against it is exactly more of an adversarial nature rather than a cooperative nature. Uh, but you can also have you know, non-deterministic models of uncertainty or stochastic models of uncertainty whenever you have you know, a lot of good probabilistic information about what's happening. But the bigger point is that multidynamical systems say that while the whole CPS has all of those features, well, the point is that it has them individually. So there's a discrete aspect in the system and come on that's just computation there's a continuous aspect in it and that's really just continuous motion and there's an adversarial aspect in it it's just a game aspect and so on and the fact is that cps has combined all of them together which gives us a huge descriptive advantage because we can at least identify well there's a big system but here's the part that's just discrete which in isolation i can easier understand Here's the part that's only continues, which in isolation I can understand as well. And then what we need to make happen to really benefit from this descriptive simplification is to carry it over to an analytic simplification by exploiting the same kind of you know, compositionality 
to tame the otherwise overwhelming CPS complexity to make sure that we understand that as a system is composed of a lot of little pieces in its description, our analysis of it should also be composed of a lot of little analysis of the little pieces of it. And indeed, um, hybrid systems is the class I'll focus on most today. Uh, but it's also the most prominent one, combined discrete dynamics with continuous dynamics. It's one example of a multi-dynamical system. Hybrid games mix in an adversarial dynamics, like if two robots meet. Stochastic hybrid systems mix in a stochastic aspect and gives you like crazy motion and dynamics and probabilistic <coughs> things like that. And another one, which isn't even in this picture, but is another one of those multi-dynamical systems principles, is distributed hybrid systems, such as what happens when you have a lot of cars down on the road. Because um, it certainly is the best way to understand them as a system that has both a distributed systems angle, like there's a lot of cars and maybe they communicate or they, they, you know, they exchange information or they use radar-based measurements from one another. And then there's a hybrid systems aspect in it, which says, well, these are not just cars that are stuck on the road forever, but they each individually move around and about, which definitely is of the continuous dynamical nature, with discrete dynamics <coughs> mixed into it because they do compute, they do think, they do reach decisions and then act. Indeed, today I'll mostly focus on the hybrid systems aspect of it. So let's first worry about the uh, modeling aspect of cyberphysical systems, where for each of those classes of, this, of systems, there is a dedicated logic for it. Differential dynamic logic is the logic for hybrid systems, and I will focus mostly on that today. It's the base case. Um, but then just keep in mind that whatever I say today extends beautifully to the adversarial case of hybrid games, in which case you have differential game logic extends beautifully to that case. Or stochastic differential dynamic logic, which happens when you mix it in stochastic dynamics. Or, for example, quantified differential dynamic logic, which uh, takes into account aspects of distributed hybrid systems, like a lot of cars or a lot of UAVs or a lot of aircraft. And indeed, these are all dynamic logics. And why is that? Well, dynamic logics were originally invented by uh, Pratt, and then pioneered further by uh, David Harre and Dexter Cozen for understanding programs. But their real calling are not programs. The real calling of dynamic logics are dynamical systems, as the name already suggests, because dynamic, dynamic logics capture in very simple, logical, essential ways what happens when things change. And it's not just programs where things change state. It's continuous dynamics as well just change the state in a different way along a continuous motion through the air. Uh, or, for example, game aspects where you know, things also change state, but they do so while keeping in mind that the individual agents in the system might reach decisions in slightly different ways with different motivations, different purposes in mind. And since CPSs are multidynamical <coughs> systems, that of course means the appropriate dynamic logics for it are also multidynamical, as you've seen on the previous slide, and capturing each of those aspects and facets of it. The principle I will be following is that of the logical trinity, where in everything I say today, we will worry first about, not that, we will worry first about the syntactical aspect, so what's the notation, what problems are we allowed to write down, then the semantical aspect, so what carries meaning, so what real or mathematical object does the syntax correspond to, what does it talk about. Of course, when I write down all kinds of little symbols and so on, we shouldn't be thinking little symbols. We should be thinking little cars, little aircraft flying around. That's what we mean. But I can't put an actual <coughs> aircraft into a logical formula and hope that anything interesting comes out of it. You know? I have to describe it in words. Well, we have to describe it more exactly in symbols. But whenever we write the syntactic, keep on pushing the wrong button. Whenever we write down the syntactic guys, we should think, oh, actually they correspond to certain semantical objects. Well, that correspondence is beautiful, but it doesn't help us anything until we operationalize it by dreaming up axiomatics that sort of relates the two. You know, syntactic transformation principles that change the syntax around to make it possible for us to understand what's going on while preserving the semantics. And we keep on doing that until we find easy expressions like true well, then we have a proof of the system. And why is that so good for our purposes? Well, because logical principles fundamentally work compositionally. 
what does A and B mean? It means A and B, that formula, is true whenever A is true and, independently, B is true. That's a piece of cake, kindergarten logic. Yeah? But then, a proof of A and B, what does that correspond to? It consists of a proof of A together with a proof of B. So our reasoning is also fundamentally compositional. That already argues that the AND operator is the most compositional operator there ever is. And all we need to make sure is that we make the same <coughs> kind of semantical and syntactical and reasoning compositionality happen, not just for the AND operator, but for all the operators that we need for cyberphysical systems. Yeah? That's going to be a little more complicated, but we'll make it work. Ah, before I go any further, if there's ever any questions at any arbitrary moment in time, because I'm not making sense to you, please just ask me at that moment, as opposed to the, you know, having the confusion build up. I don't want to do that, so please ask. This is my favorite hybrid system, the, the Wally robot. And what the Wally robot does is, for example, it moves around in our building, which is a corridor which doesn't, I mean, looks a little bit like the one out there. Except in our building at CMU, people have placed concrete pillars strategically to make sure that people bump into them. And because robots see people do that, they want to do that too. But Wally tried this a bunch of time and always got some components damaged. So he, you know, he learned his lesson and tries to avoid those obstacles right now. So what Wally wants to do is move around the corridor environment and control his acceleration and steering and all kinds of things in ways that make sure that Wally doesn't bump into this obstacle or the wall for that matter. Okay, um, now um, what Wally wants to make sure is that a certain property is true, namely that Wally's position X is different than uh, the obstacle's position M. If we, for the sake of simplicity for the moment, just assume there's a single obstacle, the concrete pillar. Of course, there's more, but the same principle will apply. Now, even if the Wally position is different than the obstacle's position right now. That's not quite sufficient. What we need to make sure is that this is always the case for which logicians have invented the box operator. Box, funny thing, means it is always the case in all the states that we could get to that Wally's position is not the obstacle's position. But of course, we have to become more precise about always when what. You know, what's the dynamics? What's happening? What's going on? So what we do intuitively is pick up Wally and squeeze him inside the box. Excuse me. When you say always is for all t, is what you mean? Uh, That's sort of the question. What does always? I mean, certainly we, we, we do mean always, but always when what? So I guess for all times is what we want. But what happens? What changes in what way? So we have to become more precise about that. So what we want to say instead is that always, as Wally moves, his position will be different than the obstacle's position, which means always, wherever Wally might be moving to, his position is different than the obstacle's position. But again, I can't like run down to the local radio shack and pick up a copy of a Wally robot and squeeze him inside the logical formula because that's not a logical formula. That's a big mess. Yeah? And I also can't even run down the, uh, sh to the shop and purchase a copy <coughs> of the Wally DVD movie because um, that still doesn't describe what Wally, Wally really does. Instead, what we need is a model of Wally, and the model of Wally is what we need to squeeze into side the box modality to become precise about the question, wait, what does that mean? <laughs> what, what changes? What evolves? In what way? Over time, how? Yeah. Okay, let's build a way up to that. Let's build a mod model of Wally. Okay, granted, a simple one, but in any case, gets the point across. So, first of all, we do need a model of the continuous motion of Wally, and, you know, what's better for that than the French equation. So the derivative, the time derivative of Wally's position will be Wally's velocity, while the time derivative of Wally's velocity will be Wally's acceleration. And you know, if the robot moves in more complicated ways, just write down a more complicated ODE. Just doesn't fit on the slide anymore then. Okay, there's the position and velocity that are changing continuously over time. And then other aspects in the system change discreetly over time, such as, you know, at this moment, Wally decides and says, I want to put my acceleration to minus b for braking. I want to decide right now that it's a great idea that Wally should be applying the brakes because otherwise he will be running into, into the concrete pillar. Of course, that's not always a great idea. You might have to do that conditionally. So you might want to say things like, if a certain start braking condition is true of the position and the uh, obstacle's position. Only then do we apply the brakes. Otherwise, we do something else, maybe accelerate or so. Uh, now, the discrete dynamics and the continuous dynamics, of course, need to meet somehow. The easiest way, 
how they could possibly meet is in a sequential composition where we first say this thing happens discreetly and then this differential equation happens continuously over time, which we might want to repeat a number of times because Wally reaches a bunch of control decisions for which logicians have invented the star operator to say this whole expression now repeats any number of times. And we remember what we wanted to do. We were developing a model of Wally. Let's call this the best model of Wally that we could possibly ever think of, which isn't the case, but for the sake of illustration. Remember that we wanted to squeeze the model of Wally inside the box, so let's do that too. There's the box modality around it, and then we attach the post condition, which now says all behavior of this very exact, precise model of Wally's dynamics is such that Wally's position will not be the obstacle's position always when we follow this um, so-called hybrid program. Now that I have at least intuitively you know, explained to you what this logical formula means, you can tell me whether it's true or not. Is it indeed true that all behavior of Wally under this model will be such that Wally's position is different than the obstacle's position? Show of hands, <coughs> who thinks this is an awesomely true logical formula? I have no support for that. Who thinks it's a false logical formula? I have no support for that either. So that, that brings us into the realm of, of three-valued logic, I guess, the unknown, which is, has a lot of support in this room. Which also, however, means I need to give you a little more time to think about it. So when Wally moves like this, he you know, changes his you know, uh, acceleration discreetly, you know, break and accelerate and break and accelerate and break and accelerate, while his velocity keeps you know, changing continuously over time, you know, it, it decreases because he's braking, then it increases again because it's, he's accelerating, but not that fast as he was braking, and then it decreases again and, 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 while his position changes accordingly. And here in this picture, I have made darn sure that I stay, bef that I stay sort of right before the obstacle's position. Hmm? Is there a circumstance where this system has no chance of avoiding collision? So is the value of b minus, you know, the plus 2.0? Mm hmm yeah. So there are no assignment to accelerate. Yes, yeah. indeed, quite true. In this particular model, so this particular model doesn't quite actually fit to this particular picture because I never actually, uh, you know, I never actually bump up the acceleration again. But even if we have a slightly, sim slightly simpler model, it, it can't be safe if it starts unsafe, right? So we need some kind of assumptions. Yeah? Logic is very good at managing assumptions. It, it, it uses the implication operator for the job. So if you know, we start out in a collision-free state, and I guess our break should work, this also would be rather nice, yeah? then all behavior of this system is such that Wally's position isn't the obstacle's position. And indeed, yeah, Stanley's unhappy, and I would be unhappy too. I have left out a, an assumption or two. Yeah? Um, this doesn't quite work. But at least now you get sort of the, the picture of, you know, we have a bunch of initial conditions usually, and then we, tr we tend to say all behavior of the system is safe. Um, in fact, we turn the, the if I don't like if statement. So we turn that around too into uh, a non deterministic choice operator because it's more atomic, a choice that says this or that happens non deterministically, arbitrarily, as we see fit. And we make up for it by adding a test statement, which is the question mark operator, which says, let me test whether at this moment the current, the logical formula not SB of X and M is true. Why do, you that, do I do that? Because that way I can give you more atomic operators out of which you can easily define the if and else. And with these non-deterministic operators, you can also say more. Because you can describe systems that are not deterministic. Why would you ever be so stupid to describe a non-deterministic system? Aren't they difficult because they have a lot of behavior? Yeah, they are. True. But if you're describing reality, and the reality includes the motion of other cars or so, you don't have a deterministic model of the human being right in front of you. You can say the car in front of you will accelerate or brake. I don't know. <laughs> That's a non-deterministic model. But you can't say exactly in these million and a half conditions will the car in front of you accelerate or brake because they probably won't be quite accurate for every person in the world. So non-determinism is a good thing for verification. In fact, it also increases simplicity. So these are the hybrid program dynamics. And now let's introduce language, for real. Hybrid programs are these guys. Before that, a question. If I don't see you, just interrupt me. Yeah. Just a small point. Uh, you defined the if in terms of the non-deterministic choice and not. Uh 
Uh huh. And is it possible to do it the other way around also? No. <coughs> Ifs are deterministic, right? If I start out with a deterministic language statement and try to define a non-deterministic one out of it, that won't work because the computation will stay deterministic. So non-deterministic is strictly better than deterministic. Uh, thank you. So, yeah? so about this uh, non-determinism and then the test, if you are other <coughs> clauses that, that may influence the test, yeah. uh, how does that work? I mean, you could have several statements within a test, right. and the other clause may, may influence it. All right. So just as you do execute, so if you have other clauses that influence the outcome of the test, they will be executed too. That will be will become more precise when I talk about the actual semantics. I didn't want to chicken out of telling you the exact semantics. I just want to front load your intuition a little bit. Hang on tight. Okay, language. Um, comes in two categories. Yes, one more point. Thank you. Um, how is it that we know that, so you said if is deterministic, mm -hmm. and we were defining it in terms of the two non-deterministic, mm -hmm. uh, whether the non-deterministic, how is it that we know that this translation always makes sure that none of the non-determinism, there's no non-determinism that leads back? We'll see. <coughs> we'll see. We'll, yeah. we'll see when, when I write down the actual definition of this. In fact, what I have here, hold on, what I have from here to here isn't quite the definition of if. Because this one is a little stronger. It says, I can always, if I feel like it, execute the then clause. But I can only skip it if the condition isn't true. So that's already a little, a sort of a half broken if. But it's a better if for this particular case because it tells us more about what Wally could be able to do. Wally could at any arbitrary moment in time decide to break. Why not? Or the driver in front of you might at arbitrary moments in time decide to break. Or the driver of the self-driving car that you're building might at arbitrary moments in time decide to break because you, he, he, he saw an interesting shop and wants to stop and you know, go there. So it's good to be more non optimistic We'll see the actual definition a little later on. This was just introduction. Excuse me. I, yes. I and one more point. Mean, what means a star? And the star means non-deterministic repetition. So repeat the thing inside the parentheses any number of times. One time, five times, zero times, 29 times, okay. or whatever you want. Non-determinism, again, is good because it allows us to explain that the system runs any number of discrete continuous control cycles any number of times because I have no way of predicting that as I'm driving my car to Paris, it will take exactly seven and a half million control cycles to get there. I don't know. So I'll just, just it's better to say, I guess I'll repeat that any number of times. No? Good. Time for the language. Comes in two categories, the hybrid programs and the differential learning logic formulas. Here they are. This is for discrete assignments. Um, so just change the variable to put the value, um, to put the value f of x into variable x as usual. Test the logical formula q whether it's true or not at the moment. So think of these as like tests whether my velocity is too high or, or test whether my distance to the other car is fine or stuff like that. Yeah? In fact, I would be allowed to test anything more complicated, but these are usually sufficient. Most importantly, differential equations. So in the middle of my programming language, I can write down a differential equation, x prime equals f of x, and it says follow this differential equation for some non-deterministic amount of time. Limited to an evolution domain constraint q. So q is, an, is a logical formula that, that, that describes to me, you know, don't leave this region q while you are following the differential <coughs> equation. Useful for, for things like, no, don't go too fast, or don't evolve for more than 20 million years without giving the discrete control a chance to act, that sort of thing. Yeah? Non-deterministic choice, so run alpha or beta arbitrarily. So for example, accelerate or brake. Think of the car in front of you. Or you know, um, do a left curve to avoid collision, or do a right curve to avoid collision. Sequential composition, so first accelerate and then brake, for example, or first control and then continuous or, or anything like that. And non-deterministic repetition. So repeat the hybrid program alpha any number of times. Zero, one, two, three, and so on. The differential dynamic logic formulas are built like logic is supposed to be built. So you compare to, say, polynomial or rational terms for inequalities or all kinds of other things. You can negate. <laughs> Say not P, you can say P and Q are true, or, or implication, they're all definable out of these guys in classical logic. 
quantifiers, uh, quantify over the real. So for all positions, something is true, or there is a velocity for which something is true, or there is a you know parameter value for which the system is safe. Most importantly, however, are these two guys. For any hybrid program, build recursively out of these guys, and for any differential dynamic logic formula P, build recursively out of these guys. Alpha box P and alpha diamond P are formulas again. And alpha box P says that all runs of alpha take us to states where P is true, whereas alpha diamond P says that there is a run of alpha such that P holds at the end. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to specify uh, parallel programs here? So uh, there are parallel extensions. I will completely skip them. Yeah. OK, here's the semantics fits on the slide. I don't actually want to explain the semantics to you like that. Just point out that if you write it down you know, in one slide, then you see very much that the semantics is compositional. For example, the semantics of the alpha non deterministic choice beta program is exactly the semantics of alpha union the semantics of beta, so the union of relations and composition of relations and so on. You know, very compositional is a function of the pieces. But I think it's easier to explain to you in pictures. So uh, a discrete assignment will take me from an old state to a new state, well, in no time passing, zero time, where, you know, the new state has as the value of x exactly whatever the old state had as the value of the right-hand side e. Okay, assignment is assignment. What can I say? Um, differential equations more interesting. So differential equation takes me from an old state omega to a new state nu. If there is a solution which slowly over time um, takes me from the old state omega to the new state nu while you know staying inside the evolution domain constraint q so this is say the region where q is true and you know of course we should be respecting the differential equations at any moment in time the value of the x prime derivative is supposed to be f of x the value of the right hand side that's what it means to solve an ode you know? But of course, not just here, but a little bit earlier too, and a little bit later too. Just always fit to the ODE. Yeah? But never leave Q. Don't you dare leave the evolution domain constraint Q. Uh, then for a test, well, a test uh, does not change the state, but at least there is a transition only if the logical formula Q is indeed true at the moment in this state. Think of it this way. If you're in a class and I give you a test, if you pass the test, you're still the same person. Your state hasn't changed. But at least you're allowed to continue to be enrolled in the class. If you fail the test, you must drop, and hopefully you've taken other courses also. Yeah? And this one works in exactly the same way. You just truncate the execution and say, that, that was a violation of the rules. Go away. Okay. Yes? Uh, when you flow, do you flow as, as far as possible? No. Or do you come any any non-determinism non is, is the key. You know, whenever we become too deterministic, about our description of the world, we will regret it because the world doesn't listen to us. Yeah. So always, when in doubt, non-determinism is the key. Yeah. Because we can always impose extra conditions on it and limit this freedom, but we can never, if you don't have a freedom, we can't add it in. If we have a lot of freedom, we can take it away again. Yeah. By, you know, for example, putting tests or so. Yeah. Okay, no, me. yes. What, what means a double bracket? I oh, um, yeah. This is the semantics notation, semantics brackets. The semantics of the logical formula is the set of all states in which it is true. So it means that W satisfies the proposition Q. Yes, W is in the set of states where Q is true. So W satisfies Q, precisely. And the semantics of, an ex of a term is just you know, um, you know, a function from real numbers to, to real numbers. Um, or, you know, so semantics brackets. Okay. For programs, it's the transition relation. So for programs, the meaning of a, of a program is a relation from initial state to final state, which is more obvious here. The meaning of a non-deterministic choice is that it can go from an old state omega to a new state nu1 whenever you know, the left subprogram alpha can do that. And I can go to the uh, program nu2, uh, to the state nu2 whenever the right subprogram can do that. Uh, so for example, I have a choice between the blue and the red curve. Sequential composition can take me from an old state to a new state through any intermediate state that I got to by running alpha and then running the second part beta. So for example, follow continuously and then do a discrete transition. But keep in mind that continuous evolution is non-deterministic. So we could have done that for a shorter amount of time as well. Sequential composition, I can run 
repeat alpha any number of times by running alpha and then alpha and then alpha any number of times. So for example, the typical you know, hybrid systems trajectories. You know, and if I want to know what's the meaning of alpha, semicolon, beta repeated, then I just take this picture, drag and drop it into this one and get the picture out of it that describes to me what does alpha, semicolon, beta star mean. Huh? Formulas, so alpha box P is true in a state if the post condition P is true in all the states that can reach by running alpha, which we just defined. There's a lot of them. Alpha diamond P is true if there is one alpha successor such that the post condition P is true. But this is the alpha span, so everything that's reachable by running alpha. <coughs> in the same state, I could also talk about is there a beta transition in the beta span? Or is there a beta transition such that all alpha transitions satisfy something? Or squeeze in propositional connectives or quantifiers everywhere, which is, gives us a very expressive logic, but uh, it has a compositional semantics which will enable us to do compositional proofs. Okay, <coughs> car dynamics, for example, so we, we already said, we start with a differential equation. The car might speed up or slow down, um, and it might do so repeatedly, but this isn't actually a model of a car because this differential equation is broken. Does anybody see why? It doesn't say the domain. Right? It doesn't say anything about the domain. What, what should the domain be? Not the property you want, that would be a bad idea. That would be a, an assumption of the system, right? But certainly our velocity, you know, shouldn't, you know, if we put the acceleration to minus b for braking and then wait for a long time, our velocity will go negative, which means we will be going backwards. And usually this isn't called braking, this is putting the gear in reverse. So what we forgot here is that we need to say, well, well hold on a second here. This describes the motion of the car while the velocity is greater or equal to zero. Right? If it's negative, it does something else. Yeah. That's a gear shift at least. Huh? Okay, now acceleration isn't always safe, right? Go figure. Uh, you need some conditions under which acceleration is safe. Um, can you, for starters, tell me what are the parameters that go into this? Maximum velocity is crucially important, or how fast are we going, for example? Yeah. What else? Maximum force. How good our brakes work, and also how good our acceleration works. Because if we now speed up, and you know, we have a darn good engine, but our brakes are lousy, um, you know, we need to take that into account. And also our reaction time. Yeah. Because if we do this now, and then because we're so shocked, it takes us a minute to recover and step on the brakes again, Oh boy, will we be driving fast? Yeah. So all kinds of effects that go into this certainly depends on A and all, all kinds of other things. In particular, the reaction time we would model like this. We would say there is a clock that we put to just give me half a second. There is a clock that we put to zero before the differential equation starts. This clock evolves with as clocks do with time derivative one. So the der time derivative of the clock t is one. And it is limited to be at most epsilon, which means we will run this differential equation for any amount of time, but at most epsilon time units. And then we ha are forced to stop, and then we can repeat and do the discrete thing again. Now your question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so when the condition is violated, does the system uh, just stick to wherever it is? Um, this condition? Yeah. It just stops before the condition is violated. If it is already stopped in the begin, if it's already violated in the beginning, uh, for what duration can it evolve while always staying in that domain? Right. Not even for zero, right? Because even duration zero would violate the condition. So it's like a test that just can't even execute. Hmm? Yeah? Is the external environment uh, taken into account? Like yes, you can, you can model, you can do this as part of your model. And it is important basically to underestimate the capabilities of the thing you're controlling and overestimate the capabilities of the things around you to, to be on the safe side. Yeah. So I'm a bit confused by the use of comma, uh, the uh, and as as. Uh, okay, I, l I omitted as many parentheses as my precedence notation allows me to do. So uh, comma, so think of parentheses goes here and here, right? So you have a system of differential equations, which, yeah, come on, it's really the same as a single differential equation, just vectorially. And then you have a formula for an evolution domain constraint. So the whole thing goes together. And before that thing, 
do we have the discrete assignment? Yeah. So comma binds tight. What's there was another the, question. Yeah. What's T prime? T prime is the time derivative of the variable T, and it's supposed to be one. So it evolves like a clock. What does it represent? T prime is the time derivative. So X prime is the time derivative of position, and T prime is the time yeah, derivative of the clock variable. So prime is velocity, but what does T prime represent? Like, what, what does this condition mean? T prime equals one means that, you know, time isn't special, right? Whoever said time is special didn't know what they were saying. Time isn't special because um, time is just, you know, if I need a clock variable like T, for example, here, then all I need to do is write down a different equation into my system that represents time by saying my derivative is the same as the derivative time is, namely one, right? And then you locally have a clock variable. If you need another clock to measure like how long has your system been going as soon as you turn on the ignition the first time, you would have just, okay, S prime equals one, <laughs> which is not reset and which is not bounded, except maybe when you want to say only use your car for five years because then it explodes. Then you would have S less or equal five years in here, yeah? okay? All right, um, this is the correct answer, um, never mind that. Now you can say, for example, under a bunch of assumptions, for example, you're initially <coughs> go, going with velocity non-negative, uh, you know, non then all motion of your car will keep a non-negative velocity, which is kind of trivial because it's in our evolution domain constraint. So by assumption, our model always says, I am always only describing the system when the velocity stays greater or equal zero. So proving that it indeed stays greater or equal zero is, yeah, a piece of cake, very boring. More interesting property is that um, all behavior of our car model that we just defined is such that the position is before the stoplight, say, or the, or the next car, or whatever M might represent. And then, of course, we need more assumptions than just the acceleration is a non-negative value and the brakes work. What other assumptions do we need? When does the system has a have a chance to always preserve that the position is less or equal to the obstacle? The Certainly, x less or equal m has to be true in the beginning. Otherwise, there's no chance. Is that the only thing we need? With velocity and right. So even if in the beginning we're not at the stoplight yet, we're like five inches away from it, and we're traveling at velocity 500 miles, something tells me that the physics, physics isn't going to allow us to prevent a collision. Or even if we're like 10 miles away, but our velocity is the speed of light, we will also hit this thing. Yeah? So there's more assumptions that you need. Um, so something that relates velocity to distance and you know depends on the force of the brakes and all kinds of things. And so, yeah. Yeah. so you didn't add that the velocity cannot be initially negative. If, if you do not specify, is it captured by the invariant of your different... It is because, yeah, you're assuming this in, in, no, implicitly already because here you say, oh, this model can only evolve in the velocities. But if the initial condition violates that, what would happen? Right. If the initial condition then says my velocity happens to be negative, Right, uh, then this system can evolve for how long? No time. Not no time, zero time, right? So a big difference. You cannot evolve this different equation for any amount of time, not even zero, but you can still evolve the repetition for zero times. So you're repeating exactly zero times, which is the only chance you have, which means you're not even starting your engine in a certain sense. And in that case, um, this condition says, you know, I'm not at the, I haven't exceeded the, the, the stoplight yet, so everything is fine. But that's for boring reasons, because you didn't even move. Right? So, but that's the only reason why I don't need to assume this. Yeah. This here would, for example, say a liveness property. The, the one we had a moment ago was a safety property. And this one now says, under a bunch of assumptions, it is the case that for every position on the road, there is a stoplight position such that my car will ultimately get to that position or actually beyond it, right? So in other words, my car will be able to move to any position on the road, which is a good property to have of a car. Yeah. Um, Elite, I need a time. Uh, how am I doing in time? Yeah, that means I will skip this example because you can look at it. Uh, what I think is still useful 
is this illustration where we say, I'm writing down hybrid programs, but they meant like pictorial illustrations. So, you know, in a non-deterministic non choice that we're running, we can run this or that, but which one, which one has a chance to succeed depends on the test. If the test is true, then I can actually run it. If the test isn't true, and I have to go somewhere else. I don't actually have a choice. In this choice, for example, they ever so subtly overlap. So if the equation is true, then both this and that test are true. So I can run both as a rate or break. But whenever they're not equal, in this particular model, I only have one choice, even if it looks like I have two choices. But one of them will be cut off. You know, and then I run this and run the differential equation. And because there's a repetition at the end, I can go back and run this again. And maybe the choice now comes out as bottom. You know, that's the way I run these guys. And here's the if and else now really defined. If q alpha else beta is the same as non-deterministic choice, the first run starts out with a test of q and then alpha, and the second one starts out with a test of not q and then beta. Yeah? And while loops, I didn't give them to you, but you've got them because it's just a non-deterministic repetition where first you need to survive the test that q is true and then do alpha any number of times. So it can actually only repeat when q is true. Otherwise, you don't get to repeat. And you can stop any number of any 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 time you want, but you need to subsequently make not Q true. So actually, you can also only stop when Q is true. Yeah? So Turing complete. Anything else you want, just define it as a piece of cake. Yeah. I think this is a good place to stop. Any questions? Forever. Thank you. Is it a star means repeat on the risk? Star means repeat any number of times. These are regular expressions, right? Choice is like the you know, alternative in a regular expression. Star is like the repeat in a regular expression. Semicolon is like the put one thing after the other concatenation in a regular expression. These are really regular expression programs, which is also why they're called regular hybrid programs. Um, the only thing that's special about them is that, you know, I can start out with different equations uh, and assignments as a basis, but the rest is build a regular expression language around it. So why do I have why? Why do I have what? Why do I have the star? Like, uh, so while will repeat also itself? Yes, this while thing will also repeat. So this is how, this is how you can say a while loop really is a non-deterministic repetition that just has guards at the loop body and guards at the exit clause. If you're building a compiler, this is what you're going to do anyhow, yeah. for example. Okay? Break or Stanley? I forgot. No.